in the vein of like the stupidest thing you saw a Marine do. I was with two six when nine 11 happened and we were actually at Fort Bragg doing some training and we came back and make a long story short. Uh, one Saturday I was mowing the yard. I lived at Camp Lejeune uh, on base and my wife comes out. I was mowing the yard. She waves the phone. I walk over. It's my duty a Lieutenant. He's like, Hey, sir, we had a Marine cut his finger off and we're medevacking him. And I'm like, oh, shit. All right, I'll be right down. It's like 10 minutes down the road. So I went in, threw on a clean shirt, shorts, drove down to the CP. And I walk in, and literally there's a Marine with Windex or 409 wiping blood off the floor when I walk in. And I'm like, what the hell happened? And the lieutenant's like, sir, I just want to start by saying there's no uh, information in the duty binder about what you do at a Marine guy's his finger off. <laughs> and I'm like, I got it, Lieutenant. What, what, the, what happened? And he's like, well, this Marine will refer to as Stumpy from his forward. He's like, Stumpy comes in carrying his finger. And he said he cut his finger off. And, you know, it's me and I have a driver and an aid duty. And I was kind of shocked because he's holding his finger. And he's like, I said, I immediately turned to my, my clerk and I said, dial 911, get an ambulance. Good move, right? Lieutenant Sink. And he's like, don't worry, Marine, we'll get it we'll get it sewed on and he turned to his assistant duty and said go find some ice and let's put the finger on ice again the lieutenant's thinking and he's like we'll take care of it and the marine's like i don't want my finger and he ran out of the office so the lieutenant and the sergeant go chasing after him running through the quad and as the lieutenant's catching up to him the marine throws his finger in the dirt I swear to god this happened what? and the sergeant runs over and you know picks up the finger and runs back to the CP and it's black. The finger turned black and it's his oh. index finger. It's a trigger finger. So he takes the finger and he washes it off in the scuttlebutt and they find some ice and they put it on ice. Eventually the Lieutenant grabs the guy and brings him back and they send him to the hospital. And, but the Marine didn't tell him what happened to his finger, but it looks real sketchy at this point. So I'm like, well, you know, I'm the XO. I got to call the CO and I tell him what I know. We don't know what happened. We just know the Marine cut his finger off. Mm -hmm. So they life flight this kid up to Raleigh, Durham to try to reattach the finger and they can't, it's too far gone. So he comes back like a week later and I, I know something sketchy. And so I'm told he's back and I have the company commander and the first sergeant bring him up. I get my sergeant major. And I bring him into the office. And I immediately read him his rights because this doesn't make sense. Most if if you cut your finger off, you say, like, "Well, I was trying to do something with my saw." The guy was sketchy about it, so I call mm -hmm. him in and read him his rights. And I'm like, "Will you explain to me what happened to your finger?" And he's like, "Oh, yes, sir. I'll tell you." He's like, uh, "I don't want to go to war. I didn't join the Marine Corps to go to war. I just thought I could get some benefits and some travel out of it." He's a grunt. He's no three eleven. He's like, "I'm not going to war. I'm just going to die because that's where we're going, right?" We're the next view out the door. And he's like, so I tied a string around my finger and drained all the blood out of my trigger finger, went out to my tire of my car and used my K bar like a fulcrum. And I cut my finger off. Oh my God. So he just admitted he's a coward and he purposely cut his finger off. And I'm like, wow. Okay. Uh, I said, wow. will you sign a statement to that effect? He's like, yes, sir. Give him a pen. We, he wrote out a statement and he came back in and I said, all right, Other hand, well, sorry. in the interim, I'm going to tell you, you were probably charging you with article 134. There may be another one. Uh, you can't do that. And he's like, uh, what? And I'm like, yeah, you, you can't just, you admitted to cowardice and you damaged yourself to avoid going to war. That's a court martial offense, probably a special, but I'll turn it over to the lawyers. I said, but I don't understand why you did that. You didn't have to. He's like, well, without a trigger finger, I can't go to war. I said, oh, contraire, I could still send you out there, just make you carry casualties. You don't have to fight. I can still send you, but don't worry, we're not. We're going to court martial you. I said, but it would have been a lot simpler had you just come in and said you were gay or uh, just said you had a drug problem and smoked some dope. We would have thrown you out either way. Mm -hmm. And you still have your finger. And he was like, really? I didn't have to cut my finger off. God, dude, like, no. what an idiot. So, yeah, we, we sent him to a special court and smoked him. But, like, that was probably the dumbest thing I saw a Marine do. Damn, that's dumb. There was a, um, 
that's so one it's funny you said if you're gay because then that was the thing right if it was yeah. like what would what would what was the what was if someone was gay what was the thing then like if someone well, came to you like, were like asking to prove it i was gonna know? say do you have to you can't make them prove it right no it's not like i'm gonna say hey here i'm gonna unzip you know prove you're gay no we would just we'd take them in his word and throw them out and that's just uh that was just a separation automatic yep wow that i'm drugs. surprised i'm surprised more people didn't do that I mean, I think being gay would be better than being uh, doing drugs. I would much rather get out because you claim to be gay than you popped on a piss test because one's a felony, yeah. one's not, right? Yeah, one's going to keep you from getting a federal job later and the other isn't. Yeah, man, yeah. that's so crazy though. Dude, I so when I was with 3-6, we were going to Marja in 2011 and they did Marja in 2010, which was obviously you know rough deployment. They were doing the push through the clear of Marja and when I got there, I was the fire's chief. I showed up. I literally can't, can't got back from uh, chief's course the day they got back from like 29 Palms and went on pre-deployment leave. So I showed up and nobody knows who I am. And there was a kid there that didn't want to deploy. I think he had done the last deployment or he had heard about the last deployment and was scared or whatever. And they were like, no, you're, you're going to be on area guard you know, there was going to be an RBE or main behind element and there were area guards, you know, for whatever, for the regiment and all that stuff. I got, you know how it works in the camps or whatever. And at some point someone told him like, I think someone told him like, Hey, you're going to be guard force. That's what they said. You're going to be guard force. And they were talking about camp guard, like it within camp Lejeune, you know, you're going to be an RBE. So you got to do something while you're there. So you're going to be TAD to go be guard force or whatever. And he was thinking guard force, guarding the the fobs and stuff in afghanistan because that happens you know for those that don't know they pull oh, yeah. they pull groups of marines you know everybody's got to give up a few guys and now oh, that's yeah. your guys that stand post you know and that's their deployment and this guy was so adamant about not going he ran and jumped off of the third deck second or third deck and i don't know if he paralyzed himself but he fucked himself up real good didn't kill himself uh luckily but he jumped off and hospitalized himself because he thought he was going to Afghanistan. And the thing was, he wasn't, it's like, you weren't even, you just misunderstood what they were telling you. That's. And another dude got a tattoo on his neck of a spider to, he thought that would get him out of it. And they're like, no, you're deploying. You're just going to get, you know, you're going to get all the administrative yeah. punishment stuff later on. Oh man. That's crazy, dude. It was, it's, what? it's so weird when you see, did you run into that a lot? I mean, cause you were combat arms, you know, basically the entire time you were, you were in. No, you know, you, I, you know, everybody talks about the 10%, you know, to me, it was more like a three or 4% of the guys you spent a lot of your, you know, the legal stuff on mm -hmm. millennials are good war fighters. You know, everybody likes to bash the millennials. It's a, it's kind of the thing. I didn't have any problems with, the millennials as war fighters. And, and what's funny is I think, you know, I'm the last year of the baby boom. I'm a 1964 birth. Uh, so I'm a real old guy by, by today's standards. And we were raised differently. And I don't get me wrong. I would have been the same as a millennium had I been raised with an iPhone and iPads and the internet. And, you know, when I was in high school, cable TV came out. You know, so I was raised on three channels. You went outside after school and played and got in fights. I went to a redneck high school. Guys had shotguns in the racks of their trucks. Mm. You know, nobody went on shooting sprees. Uh, and we were a resilient group because you had to socially interact. You had no options for entertainment. There were three TV stations that had soap operas in the afternoon when you got home from school. So you, you played sports and you hunted and fished and you interacted. And it made my generation more resilient. The, the millennial, you go through Gen X and they are, they kind of cross that boundary, you know, where they're starting to get that stuff. Uh, but the millennials are raised with all the conveniences and the internet and everything. And uh, how many guys do you think your average Lance Corporal's killed with his thumbs, right? On war games, on, mm -hmm. on Xbox or whatever, PlayStation. So th their mindset and their willingness to fight and kill was never a problem. I think they're a little more brittle emotionally as a group. I don't want to cast wide dispersions on them, but because they were, you know, they got off school, some of those guys and went home and got on the internet or did whatever. They didn't have the same social 
experience that I had where you had to deal with fights and disappointment and people. Yeah. You know, that social interaction was a lot different. So I think what happened with the millennials, great war fighters, but they're a little more brittle with regard to PTS. How their generation dealt with the stresses of combat is different because they were socialized differently with people. And dealing with disappointment and setback and things is different for their generation than mine. Mine's not better, it's just different. Mm -hmm. Same with Gen X, they're just different. So when you see your buddies get killed or, or maimed or you're dealing with some of this stuff, you're just not as well armed emotionally as my generation was, or, and we weren't as good as the, uh, uh, you know, the depression era guys that fought world war two and Korea and Vietnam. They were just hard guys, you know, it's and they had life. Be. Yeah. Yeah. And my generation was kind of the last of that into the gen Xers that were not dealing with as much, uh, convenience for a lack of a better word i would probably say that the if you're talking about ptsd or pts uh if you're i wouldn't say that we deal with it well we do deal with it differently i don't think that it's increased i don't know if it's the lifestyle or kind of upbringing has made it more prevalent but i think that we can express ourselves in more ways so we know about it more one Two, I also think that some figures about people with PTSD and stuff are inflated because I think people claim as much as they can when they get out. And there are people that have PTSD, but I think anybody that's ever done a deployment ever can say they had PTSD because you just went through seven months of living in a different kind of culture, a different lifestyle than anybody else does. And you come back from it and, you know, it's just, it may not be traumatic, but it, or whatever, it's, it's going to change you. Right. No, I I think you're, you're, you know, when I I got to command the wounded warrior regiment at the end of my career Mm -hmm. and uh, we were, we were ramping down combat operations. This was in 2015 to 17 timeframe and uh, general Neller, who I've known for a long time, I was in his battalion when he was commandant. uh, You know, we had interesting discussions about PTS and I said, I don't think we have any more or less. I think guys are more, readily willing to admit that they have problems. I think a lot of guys are, are making stuff up too. I, I had a guy who told me he had PTS, he had PTSD. And I was like, well, were you in Iraq or Afghanistan? He's like, well, I was in Kuwait. And a friend of mine, the, a guy I went to boot camp with got killed. What? Well, I, I can understand there's some tr- trauma and stress to that, but not to the level he was displaying. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got another Lance Corporal or Corporal whose best friend got his head shot off sitting next to him in a Humvee. I understand. You understand that. that That's a hellacious thing to have to experience. That level of trauma compared to you hearing about a guy you knew that got killed. I don't put those things on the same level. Yeah. You know, uh, so I think there's a it's become a cottage industry to an extent. A hundred percent. That Some of it was blown out. of, But some of the guys really had a hard time and I, I saw plenty of combat and as i tried to explain to him you know there's nothing worse than calling the parent of a marine you've lost in battle nothing nothing worse than that you feel like you failed the parent you know enemy gets a vote it doesn't matter but you still have to deal with the, the ramifications on the back end of it but when when you look at it in its totality and you say well uh you're going to have to learn to deal with this because the drugs aren't going to make this problem go away. Alcohol isn't going to make the problem go away. At some point you have to put on your big boy pants and, and come to grips with what you saw or what you did. And there's no magic bean for that. You can Mm -hmm. talk to the shrink. We can send you to talk to the chaplain. Uh, We can prescribe you meds for a while, but at some point you have to embrace this and deal with it because the alternative is a shitty life. Mm-hmm. you know it's a it's a life of misery so what do you want what do you want in your future you get to decide that regardless of what shitty things you saw or had to do in the end you have to own it and take responsibility in order to deal with it. and i'm not saying it's easy but that's the fact of the matter i used to have bad dreams all the time i saw some pretty awful things and when i got out when i was retiring i'd never seen the wizard you know and my my regimental surgeon's like, sir, your your body's pretty. I've had like ten surgeries putting me back together, and he's like, you know, you need to go see the wizard. You saw a lot of combat, and I said, I don't really have a big problem with it. And he's like, no, 
what you might in the future. And if it's not in your record, the VA ain't going to treat you. So go see the wizard. So I went and saw a really nice lieutenant here at Quantico. And, uh, you know, they had the mood lighting and the incense burning. It was kind of cliche. And, and she's like, I see you, you saw a lot of combat. And I said, yeah, I saw my share. And she was like, uh, and uh, I assume you had to kill people. And I said, yeah, I, I, I had to do some of that. And she's like, and that bothers you? I'm like, no. I said, what bothers me is zipping up a body bag on a Marine or seeing a woman and child that was hit by friendly fire or enemy fire. Those are the things that bother me. The enemy got a vote. I got a vote. We signed up for it. That that part of it didn't really bother me. But seeing a young Marine with his leg ripped off, yeah, that bothers me. Mm-hmm. You know, knowing that at home there's a family that doesn't know yet that their whole world has been altered because their son was, you know, incinerated in a Humvee in Iraq. That's what kept me up at night. Those are the things that I saw that bothered me, not the fighting. It was seeing the aftermath of, on the, of the Marines that I was privileged enough to lead. And she laughed. I said, does that make me a psycho? And she was like, no, I had mild PTSD. And I used to have a couple of dreams a week. And big surprise, I've been out seven years. I haven't seen combat in 15, you know, direct fire combat since like 2006. So it's almost 17 years. So the dreams are far, you know, bigger gaps between having them. You still have them every now and then. It's never going to go away, but to learn to deal with it and time's your friend. Mm-hmm. As long as you don't abuse alcohol and drugs and do things that, that, that set you back. But to a 19-year-old or a 20-year-old telling them not to drink because that's an expedient problem solver today to help them sleep, they don't understand that when you're 30, that's going to cease. To, that's going to be a huge problem for you. Yeah, so you better sure. deal with it now while you're 20 or 21 instead of put, kicking the can down the road drinking at night to deal with the problem. 